I keep telling y'all, I'm here for a particular reason. And that's to find where the people who are just like, life is all coming at all different directions, but still trying to find time to read. So I have not finished a book since uh, the Akatar book, but I am reading slowly but surely, trust me. Anyway, this video is all about my 13 followers because I am grateful. Listen, I do not expect to go from zero to a million in one night. And if y'all stay with me just 13, I'm good because it's like it's giving 13 reasons why. 13 reasons why I love you guys. Anyway, um, I have 13 books for my 13 followers and it's not anything in particular. I just I have about 400 books in my home library that I have have not read. So I just grabbed the first 13 on a stack to show you all the range of books or different genres that I actually like. So all of these books are books I have purchased. Um, sadly, as much as I read and as much as people know I read, nobody ever buys me any books. I'm trying to understand that. Like, I don't like gift cards. I mean, I like gift cards because I'm using them to buy books. But I like books. Give me books. A book, 10 books, 20 books, 30 books, 40 books, whatever. Anyway, so I'm going to go through and share. I'll be back in one moment while I get her dress. She wants to put on a princess dress. I'm going to put her princess dress on and then I'm going to share my 13 books for my 13 followers. Be back in a minute. Thank you, Mom. Have a great she most definitely went into the dirty clothes and wanted me to put on her princess dress that she already wore twice before. Do you think I let her? Absolutely. Because who's fighting with a three-year-old? Not me. Definitely not me. Anyway, the first book I have is Trouble Is What I Do. I do not remember where I purchased this book, um, but it's by Walter Mosley. And if you know anything about Walter Mosley, you know he is the GOAT. Like, he writes really, really well. And this is, um, oh, this is a, a Leonid McGill series. Part of the Leonid McGill series, um, which is probably why I bought it. Anyway, um, the back of it says, Leonid McGill was spent, has spent a lifetime establishing his reputation in the New York investigative scene. His seemingly infallible instincts and inside knowledge of the crime world made him the ideal man to help when Philip Worry comes knocking. Philip Catfish Worry is a 92-year-old Mississippi blues man who wants Leonid to perform a, sing a simple task, deliver a letter revealing the black lineage of a wealthy heiress and her corrupt father. And surprisingly, the opportunity to do Catfish a favor while shocking the prevailing elite mm, is too much for Leonid to resist. But when a famed and feared assassin puts a hit on catfish, Leonid must gain the trust of weary socialites, outsmart, outsmart vengeful thugs, confront the ghosts of his own felonious past, and above all, survive the truth, no matter the cost. So that's not good. So you're basically about to go and tell wealthy whites, like, yeah, y'all have a black lineage. That's a good one. I like that. Um, so that's book one. Book two, George Pelicanos, um, The Man Who Came Uptown. I read one of his books and I'm from DC and one of his books actually took place in an area not far. I guess it was like my neighboring community. And I was like, that. I knew nothing about him, but that book reeled me in. And this is another one because Uptown is like the DC area where I live. So um, this, the back of this, it says, Michael Hudson is a young man who made a mistake. Now he's surviving. Now he's surviving. Girl, it says serving. Now he's serving out a prison sentence as a result. He spends his days devouring books given to him by the prison's librarian, a young woman named Anna who develops a soft spot for her best student. Mm -hmm. Anna keeps passing Michael books until one day he disappears. Suddenly released thanks to a private detective who has his own reasons for wanting Michael on the outside. Giving rat much? Anyway, freedom comes at a cost. Michael discovers a Washington, Michael discovers a Washington D.C. that has changed dramatically during his time away. Trying to balance his new job, his love of reading, and the debt he owes to the man who arranged his release. Michael subject, Michael struggles to figure out his place in his world in this new world before he loses control and has to leave it again. 
it is good. This is really much, very much what DC is. I had moved away for maybe 10 years. And when we came back, everything was changed, like gentrification at its finest. And a lot of it, of course, um, a lot of the changes are needed. Like you want to build your city up. You don't want your city looking like it's trapped in the 80s or the 30s, you know, build it up. But this is going to be I don't remember where I got it. I don't remember when I got it. Some of my books I have had for decades, not decades, but at least like 10, 15 years, 15. Like I have books that I purchased 15 years ago. I'm not even going to do the math on that. That's a long time ago that I have not cracked open. What's next? Um, book number three. We want to do more than survive. Abolitionist teaching and the pursuit of educational freedom. I'm a teacher. I like teaching in the inner city. Um, I, in particular, urban African-American kids. That's my thing. Like, I want them to understand that no matter what plight is given to you, you can turn your life around and you could be great. You could be the first person in your family to fill in the blank, whatever that may be. Um, you're not... You're not what society may convince you you are just because you come from a certain background. So, um, and I know why I got this book because Bettina Love, she did the opening remarks for the school district that I work for. And it was just, everything she was saying was so spot on. I was like, I love it. And I honestly am not a fan of a lot of people in education because I feel like a lot of people in high positions if they taught, it was like two, three years max. Um, I'm on my 13th, 13th year of teaching, so I value people who seemingly understand like really what's going on in the inner cities. So that's book three. Yeah, book three. Book four, Bomb by Darlene Perkins Valdez. I read her book, Quench. So good, so good. And I always tell myself, like, I'm over reading slave novels, but then I read Yellow Wife, um, Basadica Johnson, I believe, and blew me away. So I can't write off um, slave novels. They're just like, give me good insight. And um, I don't know, I don't know. It's like, as a black woman, you hate reading things about a moment in time where everything was set up against you and the black family but um i do like reading about that era i, I don't know why i just don't know why um because it's a lot of things that do like piss me off um but anyway hang on one second somebody's just gonna squeeze the bottle into like it bursts. You can take it upstairs if you want to squeeze it and bust it or in the kitchen. Okay? Thank you. She's so cute. Anyway, the back of it says, The Civil War has ended and Madge, Sadie, and Hemp have each come to Chicago in search of a new life. Born with magical hands, Madge has the power to discern others' suffering and ease it, but she cannot heal her own damaged heart. To mend herself and continue to help those in need, she must return to Tennessee to face the women healers who rejected her as a child. Sadie's, Sadie can commune with the dead, but until she makes peace with her father, she too cannot fully engage her gift. Dad is talking. Answer, answer Hi. that. I'm sorry for that little intermission. Who knew that a three-year-old knew how to answer the phone? And then her daddy called, so come on, daddy's girl. Anyway, um, I'm going to jump right back in. So uh, where did I stop off at? Do, 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 do. Who rejected her as a child, blah, 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 blah. Searching for his missing family, Hemp arrives in this northern city that shimmers with possibility, but redemption cannot be possible until he is reunited with those taken from him. That's the part that I love is when like we rewrite history and I love the magic we put into it. Like Kindred, the, the novel Kindred. Anyway, in the bitter aftermath of a terrible bloody war, as a divided nation tries to come together once again, Madge, Sadie, and Hemp will be caught up in an unexpected battle for survival in a community desperate to lay the pain of the past to rest. That's why I like that. I like rewriting history because it's 
a lot of trauma in history. And when you can rewrite it so that you or your people actually win, it's nothing better than that. Uh, next is a question of a question of power by Bessie Head. I know exactly why I ordered this book because one of my favorite poets, I guess he's a poet, he's an actor, um, Soul Williams. He used to be Lynn's boyfriend on Girlfriends. He had posted a picture a long time. Like this book is, I bought this book a long time ago. Um, he was at the beach and. This is what he was reading. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to read it too. And this book is about, does it say what it's about? I guess this is the synopsis, but okay, I'll read it. Um, And this is the top of my bookshelf because the lighting just is giving beautiful skin on this side of the room. Anyway, your mother was insane. If you're not careful, you'll get insane just like your mother. Your mother was a white woman. They had to lock her up as she was having a child by a stable boy who was a native. It is never clear to Elizabeth whether the mission school's principal, whether the mission school principal's cruel, cruel res, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> whether the mission school principal's cruel revelation. Why is this so hard to say? Like I forgot to read. I forgot how to read. Anyway, I'm going to keep trying this. Sally sells seashells by the seashore. I could do it. It's, it is never clear to Elizabeth whether the mission school principal's cruel revelation of her origins is at the bottom of her mental breakdown. Boom. Got it. She has left South Africa with her son and is living in the village of Motabang, the place of sand in Botswana where there are no street lights at night. In the darkness of this country where people turn and look at her with vague curiosity as an outsider, she establishes she establishes an entirely abnormal relationship relationship with two men. A mind bending book, book which takes the reader in and out of sanity. It just sounds good. And I didn't even read the synopsis when I ordered this. I remember like clearly ordering this and I was just like he read it. It's going to be great and it sounds great. That was book five. Book comes after five is six. Book six is Tales of the South Carolina Low Country by Nancy Ryan. I went to, why were we in South Carolina? I don't think I got this in South Carolina, actually. I did visit South Carolina, but I bought this in New Orleans at the Whitney Plantation. They have a, a lovely bookstore. That's where I got this. Um, I'm obsessed with I'm obsessed I'm obsessed with history and especially like the land and how um, just how people lived. So I grabbed this book um, because of the the trees on the front. You can see that. Like I forget what kind what kind of tree you call it. Is it like hanging seamoss? Somebody let me know in the comments. Um, but anyway, I'll read the back for you. According to archivists at the Library of Congress, South Carolina is rich in folklore, is richer in folklore than any other state. After traveling almost every... I don't know why I can't read today, guys. Maybe because I've been off of work for an hour and a half. After traveling almost every back road in South in several South Carolina countries, Nancy Ryan wholeheartedly supports the claim. With her tape recorder in hand, the author interviewed dozens of low country people, finding that almost every person had a story to tell. See? It's like, that's what I love. That's what I love. Anyway, she sought out everyone from millionaires to the humblest of coastal people. From their narratives, she has fashioned a collection of stories steeped in the history and character of the low country. Some of the tales in the collection are humorous, some are mysterious, others are positively eerie. There are stories of killer hurricanes, bizarre voodoo practices, and in inexplicable happenings. Effortlessly, the author takes us from a, a gorgeous, I was going to say gorgeous, like, somebody get me. <laughs> Maybe I should just try another day, but I'm, I'm going to keep going. Uh, effortlessly, the author takes us from a gorgeous plantation estate of the 1850s to an overgrown and forbidden ceremony. Cere ceremony? It's cemetery. Yo, I'm killing myself right now. In 1979, and she never fails to keep our attention on this somewhat alien but fascinating world. A world peopled with witch doctors, ghosts, cruel overseers, slaves, and world-famous personalities. 
Nancy Ryan has taken scattered bits of folklore and oral narratives, combined these with her gift of, gift of storytelling, and created a wonderfully engaging book that will entertain readers for years to come. I feel like um, we were in New Orleans when I bought this, but I got the South Carolina version. It just clicked on me that my father's and my father's elders are from South Carolina, Monk's Corner, to be exact. So I'm always interested in that. And the Geechee people, <sighs> Gullah, <sighs> I just like. I don't know. I like history. Next, do y'all get the energy of the books I read? I think y'all kind of get it. Next is Toni Morrison's Sulla. I don't know if I'm saying that right. I don't. I don't know if I'm saying that right. But anyway, two girls who grow up. First of all, before I read the back, it's Toni Morrison. Like, I don't know why I bought the book other than it's Toni Morrison. Okay. Two girls who grow up to become women. Two friends who become something worse than enemies. In this brilliantly imagined novel, Nobel Prize laureate Toni Morrison tells the story of Nell Wright and Sulla Peace, who meet as children in the small town of Medallion, Ohio. Their devotion is fierce enough to withstand bullies and the burden of dreadful secrets. It endures even after Nell has grown up to be a pillar of the black community and Sulla has become a pariah. But their friendship ends in an unfortunate in an unforgivable betrayal, or does it end? Terrifying, comic, ribald, and tragic. Sulla is a work that overflows with life. I like it. I'm, I haven't read it yet, but clearly, God willing, one day I'll get to it. Um, the Black Notebook by Patrick Modiano, who was winner the winner of a Nobel Prize in Literature. That's why I bought this book. Um, I honestly, if he wrote anything else, I have no idea. But the book is about, first of all, he is, he has more than 20 novels. So I'm clearly behind. Um, where is he from? He lives in Paris. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing this part for me because I'm like, who is Patrick Mardiano? Um, the book is about Paris in the 1960s was a city rife with suspicion and barely suppressed violence. Amid this tension, Jean, Jean, a young writer adrift met and fell for Danny, an enigmatic woman fleeing a troubled past. A half century later, with his old black notebook as a guide, he retraces this fateful period in his life, recounting how, through Danny, he became mixed up with a group of unsavory characters connected by a shadowy crime. Soon, Jean, too, was a person of interest to the detective pursuing their case, a detective who will finally provide the key to Danny's darkest secret. The Black Notebook bears all the hallmarks of this literary master's unsettling and intensely atmospheric style. Patrick Mariano invites us into his unique world, a Paris infused with melancholy, uncertain danger, and the fading echoes of love, of lost love. I like love, and it's lost love. Like, come on. But I really, I love, I definitely grabbed this book because he has an award, Nobel Peace Prize. I don't know if it's for, I don't know if it's for this particular book, but anybody who has a Nobel Peace Prize, the book is worthy of being read. Next is Stephanie Johnson. Tanger Ray. Did y'all see that cute lady on Humans of New York? Her. Right here. That's why I bought this book. And it was also a book club pick for my mommy group. So I'm excited to read this. Yes, 2019 Humans of New York featured a photo of a woman in an outrageous fur coat and hat she made herself. Like she had the most, the most bubbly personality. And it was just like, it was infectious. And um, I remember reading, this, reading her story on there and it was just like, oh, I want to read it. So this is a mini biography. This was what it, this was the picture. And so it's her, it's her biography. Um, she wrote it with the guy of Humans of New York. And I applaud him for recognizing like her story needed to be told. And I just need to read it. heard something i need to sip some hot chocolate and yes it is um like 90 degrees here and i had hot chocolate because it's too late for coffee and uh, next up this was a reese book club pick which is why i got it the proposal by jasmine guillory so everything i read isn't heavy heavy this is just a fun cute read my freelance writer and it's about a writer. Come on. I didn't even read the back of it. I just saw it and grabbed it because 
Reese's Book Clubs are good. When freelance writer Nicole Patterson goes to a Dodgers game with her actor boyfriend, his man bun, and his bros, the last thing she expects is expects is a scoreboard proposal saying no isn't the hard part they've been dating for only five months and he can't even spell her name correctly <laughs> the hard part is having to face a stadium full of disappointed fans at the game with his sister carlos ibarra comes to nick's rescue and rushes her away from a camera crew he's even there for her when the video goes viral and nick's social media blows up in a bad way nick knows that in the wilds of la a handsome doctor like carlos can't be looking for anything serious so she embarks on an epic rebound with him filled with fun food food fun and fantastic sex <laughs> but when their glorified hookups start breaking the rules one of them has to be smart enough to put on the brakes. That's cute. That's cute. That's so cute. Yeah, I'm excited to read that. <laughs> really excited. We have a guest. We're on book 11. And this is Grace Lee Boggs, The Next American Revolution. If you don't know anything about this amazing person and her husband, please go on YouTube after you watch this and after you like and subscribe and comment look her up she is the most brilliant the most patient loving sincere person that i have seen in quite some time it's a, it's a couple of people up there with her but she's just just google it go youtube her um there i actually discovered her on youtube there was a video with her and her husband um I don't know if it came before or after the book, but what they did in Detroit was just phenomenal. Um, it is, it's basically, I'm just reading a little fine print here, sustainable activism for the 21st century. And it's a forward by Danny Glover, but it's very heavy. If you are interested in the plight of people in the inner city, like what she does is amazing. I actually want to tell her so many things or actually do tell her so many things after things that she has thought of and created. Like her and her husband used to host um, like just kickbacks where they would kick back with some of the top people. I want to say Danny Glover included. Um, like, and these aren't the actual people. It may have been, but I'm just saying like, Harry, Harry Belafonte and all these people who were ingratiated in the movement of the 60s and 70s and just trying to, you know, have justice and equality. She would host them like they'd eat and just talk politics. Like, come on. How great is that? Um, number 12, August Town by Key Miller. Don't know when I bought it. This was definitely like, you know, we impulse by. We stop in Barnes and Noble and we just grab a cover um i grabbed this cover and it's about ma taffy ma taffy may be blind but she sees everything so when her great nephew kaya comes home from school in tears what she senses sends a deep fear running through her a teacher has cut off kaya's dreadlocks i got dreadlocks i wish you would Anyway, a violation of the family's Rastafarian beliefs and this single impulse action will have ramifications that stretch throughout the entire community. Kaya's story brings back memories from Montif's youth, Montaffy's youth, including the legend of the flying preacher man and his ties to the history of Jamaican oppression and resistance, all of which will reverberate through to the present and change August Town forever. Vividly bringing in life Vividly bring into life Jamaica in the 1980s, August Town follows one family struggle to rise above the brutal vicissitudes of history, race, class, collective memory, violence, and myth. You had me at, she didn't cut your locks, because why are you touching my hair and why are you bringing scissors that close to me? And this book, number 13, I'm actually on page 18. I've like, when I, when I want to take a little intermission from reading, not even an intermission when I know I'm not going to have time to just like jump right into another book or I'm still confused about which book I want to read next. I turn to this. Joan D Didion. Let me tell you what I mean. And this is my second book of hers that I read. I honestly don't remember the name of the first one, but I love her writing. Like, cool chick. When I found out she passed, I was like, Lord have mercy. But um, this book, and I'm not going to read the synopsis, it's a collection of essays that she wrote. And it also, 
it's always it, I love going back to this book because I like her I love her writing style and I love the way she tells like she could be witty she could tell jokes she can also go political she can like she just can write from so many different angles all in the same essay so I'm a huge fan of Joan Didion she's stepping on the trash bag Anyway, these are the books for my 13 subscribers. Thank you all for subscribing. I really appreciate it. And um, please feel free to share all of my videos because I just want people to understand, like, when you are when you have all these things in life, I say this all the time. Is this going to be my speech forever? Like, but I say it all the time. I really want people to understand that just because you have to live life, like work, kids, partnerships friendships all these things you have to sustain you can still do it and still make time for reading in your own way so thank you for watching let me go make dinner or um take a kid to practice or watch a show or um clean up one of those things <laughs>